So good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you for letting me have this chance to present to you. I have a team in the back somewhere, which I won't point out now, maybe later. Uh, so if you have questions, if, if I say something wrong, if you agree there's not going to be a buzzer or anything, but possibly. Um, so I don't need to introduce myself. I actually had it in my notes that I need to introduce myself, so that's good. I don't have to. One little change, my title changed. So I don't have knowledge mobilization in my title anymore, but strategic projects and initiatives, which is very similar. And knowledge mobilization is just becoming integrated into everything that we do, as opposed to a separate um, document that we need to look at. So one of the projects that I lead for the national office is a circle project, which I'm going to talk about today. Um, one thing I didn't notice in your presentation, Michael and Corey, is there's no like Twitter feeds. So can I promote, take pictures, post stuff on Twitter, let's get conversations going. Hashtag mentoring matters. Sure. Yeah. Is that the right one? Which sure. one would you prefer? Uh, yeah, that works. That That's good. We're, we're at VVBSC, so the national office. Um, but yeah, I think that having these conversations online and getting us seen by Philippines or Europe or wherever is important. So pictures, tweets, big screens, you don't have to take me on app. I won't be offended. <laughs> so before I start, I'm going to go to the video. Because I think that this will set the tone for our meeting. If I just click it, it'll work. Okay, I didn't touch anything yet. <laughs> yeah. We don't have a, uh, a commercial to start that we have. To He's going to have to adjust to this red circle because I'm an educator and I want to walk around and talk to each of you. Young people are everything. They are innovative, they are inquisitive, they are radical, and they are loving. Young people have so much to offer us and so much to teach. As co-founder and CEO of the Youth Mentoring Action Network, a mentoring nonprofit here in the Inland Empire, I have had ample opportunity to listen to and build alongside young people. Now while some of these moments have been difficult and challenging, all of them have been absolutely worthwhile. Folks engaged in youth work today have a really big responsibility. There's a lot happening in our world. We are engaged in epic and real life battles against racism, heteropatriarchy, rape culture, and so much more. If there's one thing that young people need, it is a network of support. People that can help them to process and navigate the myriad of issues that they face. Young people have an incredible opportunity to build the world anew, but they need the love, support, and dedication of critical mentors to help them do it. To that young people face a myriad of issues, this is what I mean. These images are for young people, and some of these faces may be immediately recognizable to you. They may, in fact, help to sort of get you to understand the theme that is going to emerge here. Each of these young people have been victims of murder or assault. The first picture is of Trayvon Martin, who was 17 when he was shot and killed by a neighborhood watchman. The second picture is of Monique Tillman, who was assaulted by a mall cop when she was riding her bike through the parking lot. The third picture is of Tamir Rice, a 12-year-old who was playing in a park when he was shot and killed by a police officer. And the fourth picture is of Dejera Becton, who was pinned down and sat upon when she, when, she attended, when she attended a pool party. It's important for us to say their names. What each of these young people have in common is not only that they have been victims, but that their victimhood is a result of race, class, and heteropatriarchy. So how do mentors help? I've had the opportunity to travel around the country and talk to and train mentors about these issues, and I often show them these slides. I show them these visuals with the purpose of asking them this question. If you had been a mentor to one of these young people, what kinds of conversations might you have had with them? Now given the stories of each of these young people, that kind of question typically evokes a lot of gasps and sighs. 
Because this is a difficult conversation to have with young people. It's a difficult conversation to have with one another. And so we often avoid these conversations in favor of our own comfort. But these are conversations that we must have if we are to equip young people with the tools that they need to make change. Critical mentoring is a powerful tool. It's a blend of critical race theory and mentoring elements that help us to focus on addressing the context that youth exist in. Critical race theory says, or we use critical race theory to discuss and engage in conversations about racism, to reject colorblindness and liberalism, and to value the narratives of marginalized people. Critical mentoring essentially says that if young people's context were water and air, they'd be toxic, impossible to breathe, impossible to breathe. Mentoring must move to clear the water and purify the air. It is not about using mentoring to manage symptoms. It's about leveraging mentoring to address root causes. When we are engaged in youth mentoring, we are often asking young people to fix themselves. And we do that when we know full well that their contexts are toxic. Why do we ask black youth, <clears throat> for example, to pull up their pants and appear more respectable when we know that black men in suits are harassed? <clears throat> Why do we ask marginalized youth to engage in schools when we know that schools are often sites of trauma for young people. So critical mentoring asks mentors to consider the context that youth exist in and to, then, and to then alter their mentoring practices to help young people to address these issues. Critical mentoring is also about being youth-centric. Now this is not separate or neatly divorced from the idea of critically considering context. In fact, if you are a youth mentor who's working with a marginalized young person, it's your responsibility to ensure that young people who are typically without voice power and choice have voice power and choice. There are four elements that are involved in being youth-centric. And typically, my youth co-facilitators give this slide, so I give them full credit for all of these points. Those four elements are recognizing that youth are capable, providing youth with a platform, passing the mic, and letting youth lead. Recognizing that youth are capable is about combating our adultism. Adultism that says that young people shouldn't have opinions and that they're not ready to lead in this, in this way. Providing a platform is about ensuring that young people have space and place to innovate and partner with us in this work. Passing the mic is exactly that. There's a saying that you don't need to be a voice for the voiceless, just pass the mic. In the same way, we should not always have to speak on behalf of young people. We should just give them opportunities to speak for themselves. And finally, we need to let young people lead. And they should be leading in various ways. They should be running our programs. They should be running this event. They should be prepared and poised to take over our positions when we move on. And young people are more than capable. They can do it. Angela Davis said that young people should be able to see further since they are standing on our shoulders. Letting youth lead and youth centrism in general is not about adults disappearing or leaving the picture. As a matter of fact, one of the most important components of critical mentoring is the concept of intergenerational dialogue. I want young people to understand that mentors have what Reverend Alfonso Wyatt calls elder wisdom. We have sacred knowledge to pass down and share if only young people will listen. Mentoring is supposed to be a reciprocal process, an exchange in which mentor and protege are in this ongoing process of wokeness. There's so much work to be done in our world, and mentoring should be at the very heart of that liberation work, if only adults would be willing to make themselves more relevant. Young people deserve the best of us so that they can be better than us. Thank you. So, 
we were lucky. We would have had Tori with us today because she was in, we were lucky to have her with us yesterday for about four hours. And after she finished, I said, I have to show you my study because I just think it's relevant. I'm really excited to be here because and today I'm going to talk about so that was yesterday, the picture. It's on the screen. She was with us at the office in Edmonton, the Big Brothers Big Sisters. I guess it's not Big Brothers. It's Boys and Girls Club, Big Brothers Big Sisters. <laughs> I will get it one day, but that's it. So she was with us to talk about critical mentoring. And critical mentoring really is um, a key element of the super club. I'm not going to read everything today that is on the screen. And the screen, the, the PowerPoint, I apologize, is full of words. But I think that for this, in terms of research, and all the mobilization, it's important for the to be there. And I think it'll be shared. You guys will probably get a copy of it, and you'll have access to it. Um, the PowerPoints, I know it's nice to have a picture, and then someone talks, but we'll let you read. So did you know that in the US, mentoring is fifth out of 31 strategies for rate of success in preventing criminal violent behavior? Out of those five, it is also the most cost-effective strategy. Research shows that at-risk youth who are connected to caring individuals are more likely to resist negative influences than their peers who are not in a supportive relationship. To date, there has been no impact evaluation of the mentoring program from Canada, uh, with the specific objecti objective of decreasing criminalization, delinquent trajectories, and reducing the associated risk factors. So that's what this project is all about. It's really to look at that. The Circle Project is funded by Public Safety Canada and under the uh, National Crime Prevention Strategy. And the strategy's uh, main outcome, the desired outcome long term, is reducing the offending and non targeted. That wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> is that TED Talk or her talk on that USB? It is, no, but we're just about to tweet it out. Oh, okay. yeah, and the TED Talk was, uh, I think it was only released in February, so, and, and do people know Tori? Has anybody seen Tori before? I know that some of you have. Okay, but Tori is excellent, and uh, she has a book, and there's a book, and I did put it in the PowerPoint, but the Critical Mentoring book is a great resource to have. What's um, her name? I'm sorry, Tori. Tori Weaston Sheridan. So, but it's, it'll be in the PowerPoint that you'll okay. see. So, which slide are we at? Project landing. My print, my print type came recto verso, which is French. Do you guys use recto verso? Yes, back and forth? No, no. Okay. So the project mandate, so line with the National Crime Prevention uh, Strategy. In 2016, the National Office of the Brothers and Sisters of Canada received funding um, for a five-year pilot project to take one of our regular programs, a normal one-to-one community-based uh, mentoring program, if I get that right, and adapt it into the, uh, into the model that would address how <coughs> So the agreement included uh, working in three uh, regions, so Saskatoon, Grand Deary, and here in Edmonton. It included uh, a five-year pilot project, and then the project evaluation component, which is both uh, looking at our process and how did we implement this project, as well as the impact, what happened with the youth that came through our project. Um, for questions, if there are any questions, just raise your hand and we can ask. I can wait till the end too, but we can ask throughout the forum. So the project team, there's a variety of people um, involved from national office, our funder, um, and then local staff, so frontline staff. And I'll just ask, I won't ask you to come up here, I won't ask you, but can you just raise your hands, the ones that are part of the project? So they're kind of all on that side. <laughs> <laughs> Question, yes. if you have, they are the frontline staff that are dealing with the implementation, they're dealing with the youth and the mentors that come through the door. If you have questions about that. They're probably better placed to answer those questions than I am. So during the networking time, please go see them. We do have a program evaluator as well, Dr. Melanie Banya. She has um, a background in criminology, so it helped in terms of us being able to um, to evaluate. She had she had a little bit of experience dealing with that population. So the interesting part, the mentoring program itself. So. What is the program? It's an adaptation of the one-to-one -one community based model. It's the program is known as a circle, uh, was originally titled Mentoring for Good, mentoring, mentoring for Change, Mentoring for Good, but we use the circle. They focus on youth at risk and becoming involved in the criminal justice system, sorry. And um, you know, what we do is we've enhanced the program training for the youth, uh, sorry, for the mentors, and we've changed a little bit how we, we work with the youth. 
So what is the what is the enhancement? So we have increased mentor commitment. So we're looking at 18, 18 month commitment versus a 12 month commitment. Longer that they can stay matched, the more impact that there will be between um, on the youth. That's at least what we're we're suggesting, we're proposing. The enhanced mentor training. So we're using external trainers as well as the internal uh, trainers or the training programs that exist through the National Center of Big Brothers and Big Sisters. We're doing a little bit more supervision and support of each match. So there's a lot more match monitoring that's happening or a different type of match monitoring that's happening through the, the 12 to 18 months and beyond as they last. So far it's 2016, so we haven't had any that have gone beyond two years. We're at about the 18 month mark for 12 months and 18 months. For some. We have the advocacy and training role that we're asking mentors to take on. So we want them to be able to interact with the youth systems. So Tori referenced, you know, that a youth has, has a network around them and they have a network of support. So it could be a social worker, it could be a foster parent, it could be their, their parents, their grandparents. Uh, there could be a variety of people that that youth has to interact with. And so we want to make sure that our mentors and our staff are able to interact with that network of people that surround them then that they can advocate for them, help them to move forward and, and not just stay uh, within the traumas that they're doing. So there's tangible supports for youth, which programs are meant to serve the marginalized youth um, and, and look at the person as a whole. So a little bit, again, what Tori said, you know, what is really going on with the air that they're breathing and the water that they're drinking? Is it toxic? And if it is, how do we deal with that? How do we help them as they're going through those challenges? Um, and youth engagement, so I think that that's something we need to work on perhaps a little bit more in terms of we ask them what kind of group uh, sessions do they want, but you know, maybe getting a little bit uh, better in doing that over the years in terms of getting them involved in the development of the program, um, but it is one of the goals of the program. And then there's group activities. So the group activities that uh, exist are for those who are ready to be matched. There are those that are already matched and that would like to come. And that there could be the choose they want to be in a group session as opposed to being matched, and or they want to be matched later on. So there's a variety, a couple of ways that they can be part of the uh, group session. So fine. Mm -hmm. ah, so the eligibility criteria. So how does a youth get into the program? So we talked about the the age. Um, we also look at four out of the ten like that uh, a child needs to be facing. And I think in a lot of cases they face more than just those four, but they need to have a minimum of four. The risk factors for selected for inclusion in the evaluation correspond to the main risk factors of interest to the National Crime Prevention Strategy of Public Safety and Conduct. These behaviors are substance abuse, offending, aggression, and violence, and school disengagement. Given the project's intention to focus on resiliency rather than on the risk, it was deemed important to avoid committing to lengthy risk assessments. Stacy, question. Yep. Yeah. So if you go up one page, yeah. page six. So it says here the target group includes all of these individuals, so they must be indigenous? Yes? No, the target group are, so that's a target group. They need to be the next page, they need to have four of those criteria. But this is who we're targeting. So not all of them are indigenous, not all of them are living in care or leaving care. But those are, that's the target market. If you're looking at marketing, that's the target market that we're after. But if others come in that are non-indigenous, they're Okay, just clear. Yeah, no problem. But they do have four, yes. minimum of four. Yes. So mentoring can be, be begin in a variety of ways depending on the needs and desires of the young person. You can casually meet in group um, group setting and determine if there is a connection with a volunteer, uh, or they can be presented um, with a one-to-one -one mentoring option. Information is collected through conversation, so that's the evaluation piece. So we collect information through questionnaires, um, through conversations, and uh, actually that's not the evaluation piece. My mistake. This is through the matching. So how are we deciding on the matching? We need to speak to them. Sometimes I think, correct me if I'm wrong, sometimes we decide who they're matched with or we're, we'll make a recommendation, but they do have uh, Stacy, can I ask a couple questions? Sure. So looking at those uh, criteria for inclusion, yeah. are they all weighted the same? So if someone only has two of these risk factors, I like to call them, or two of these challenges, but they're like 
mental health issues where there's tons of gaps in services, for example, or the increase, which means they're kind of trivial. Do they get, does that get weighted more so than some of the others, or is it just literally four out of 10? It needs to have four out of 10. Okay, and then my other question is, it's a resiliency-based model, mm -hmm. but all of these eligibility criteria, not all, but a significant number are focused on the, what's missing, kind of the challenges, yes. right? So is there also, I mean, we're going to talk about this later, some some assessments of what are the strengths that the youth are bringing or that their networks have? Or? Uh, we're not looking necessarily at strengths. So resiliency so is, is, the, uh, is the strengths of the youth. But she was asking about the strengths within the networks. It's not the strengths within the networks. We look at the individual strength of the resiliency, which is coming up, but not necessarily their environment. I have a question as well. Um, so there's nothing here about um, stable living arrangements. Housing. Um, what's what's happening? Where where are these kids coming from, and are they living on the street? Uh, so, in the previous slide, we said you know the ones that are targeted are those living in care, leaving care. Um, are they on the street? I don't think that you know we will ask them to live on the street. I guess. What would you do if someone homeless? Was on the they get homeless. That's what I'm wondering. Would like, they would be eligible. eligible, but I don't think that it's. Yeah. It's not. So they wouldn't be eligible. Sorry, they would be eligible for the program. Yes. But it's not listed as a, as a risk factor. It might be. I'm going to make, take a note. It could be something that we add. But this is just a, 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 the list that's based on what's in the public safety Canada strategy. And it corresponds. And I think the list was designed a little. Carrie, we talked about this a little bit yesterday. The list was designed with agency. With agency. Yeah. Input. So the question about homelessness. Um, probably the best way to answer it. Absolutely, being homeless wouldn't, would, could make you eligible for the yeah. program, um, but having some sort of stability um, is, is important to creating a mentoring relationship. So, yeah. I'm gonna list, I'm gonna add it because I don't think any of our documentation has anything listed or a question about homelessness, so that's interesting. I, I also wanted to just comment, not to open up a big can of words, but it might, can life obstacles and being Indigenous or an other marginalized or racialized identity is identified under that. To me, that's not necessarily a life obstacle because there's a lot of strength that comes from some of those cultural teachings and learnings. Um, and it's not really an obstacle. I mean, there is systemic racism that creates problems, but the obstacle is the racism, not so much being Indigenous or Marginal. So I guess I'm wondering about that. I think I would disagree that being marginalized or minority is a lot of And I think that Tories, you know, the intro would have that. Um, maybe we don't have to flesh it out as Indigenous is listed on its own line, right? It's not listed as uh, you know, something, and it's not a negative. It's just that there are challenges that Indigenous populations face that um, are, are more com complex than, than someone who's, you know, white and short. Um, another thing that you mentioned were uh, the mentoring circle uh, moves through these challenging life circumstances, and it seems that some of these could be temporary, but race isn't yes. temporary, so how would the circle move forward and through and what's like and so the idea is really um it's not to label someone it, it, it this is this is a, a uh a criteria that you know the government has has kind of mandated we need to have we want to target these that are higher risk and higher risk means they have some of these factors there might be some that are not listed there there might be a variety and perhaps if they do have two then and we deem them as being high risk we might keep, we would, we would keep them, but I don't think if they're really high risk, they would have to. They probably have a couple, and they might not even have to. So the point is really to look at the youth and everything that's around them. And they could be, uh, they could be gay or questioning. They could be indigenous. They could be living in poverty. They could have an alcoholic parent. They could have all of those things. 
that yes, being indigenous will never change, or being black will never change, but their sexuality could change. It might, it might not, but it could. The living with their parents who have alcoholism or mental health issues, that could change. So we need to be able to adapt, and we're gonna get to that in terms of how we deal with them. That's one of the big parts, is that we need to adapt to who we're dealing with in front of us instead of making them, fixing them, so that they can adapt to our program. So this is just criteria, and again, we have a funded program. When you're dealing with a funder, you kind of have no choice but to tick some of those boxes, right? But how we deal with them, we have to look at that person. And I think that that's part of the influence that we can have through this pilot, we're testing out the model, we're testing out this, is that we can go back then to the government and say, hey, you know, these cri criteria that are listed is maybe not um, how we should be doing this. It maybe highlights too many risk factors and it makes me feel bad, or whoever's dealing with them. That's the, the, beautif the beauty of having a pilot project, is to be able to do that. But we needed to start, start somewhere. So one, one thing I noticed that maybe not on that list, and I'm not sure if it was excluded intentionally, is disability and learning challenges. So it's not there. Um, learning challenges might be, might be mental health, disabilities, it wasn't retained. Yeah. I'm going to do all of this that one as well. But the mar marginalised kind of covers all this kind of cover yeah. on at the end there. Can you give you a wiggle room? Yeah. IT, is that handy? Is that marginalised youth yes, come yes. under an umbrella? Yes, yes. Kind of covers an umbrella. Yeah. That's true. And we are looking at um, risk factors that would lead to delinquent trajectories, right? So having a disability is not necessarily perhaps labelled as, oh, if they have a disability, they're likely meet with the police, you know, whereas these oh, ones here are, 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 you know, more, <coughs> we have a, we might have a problem. Yeah, yeah. And indigenous, going back to indigenous, I, I, I agree with you, sometimes we label it things, but in our prisons, in our jails, yeah. and so, but again, I don't think it's an issue with the youth, it's an issue with our society and our right. system mm -hmm. and the context of there. Right. The same thing with racial also, like being LGBTQ right. or having black skin yeah. or being, Asian has like is not the issue. It's about how our yeah, society sure. system and yes. supports them. Do you give them don't give them the space to give them? I couldn't agree yeah. more. I think in, in this context we're, we're dealing with, with funders and we have to be able they need to be able to say that they're doing things for those communities in order to reduce and so that's why you have a box to tick, right? So I'm gonna keep going because it's already halfway lose our advance in time. So the overall purpose of the evaluation I mentioned before is to um, to make sure that the project is being delivered in the way that we said that, that it would be. We want to look at the quality of the design of the program and look at the implementation of the project. And we want to look at the, the impact and the risk factors and resiliency of the in, uh, in the program. I'm just trying to find my notes. Okay. So the one thing that's in, that I should share is the Project Advisory Committee, so you saw that list of names before, and the third party evaluator, they decided together that the transformative paradigm, a transformative paradigm would be used with mixed, method, mixed methods and participatory approach was the most suitable for the project evaluation. So elements of the transformative paradigm are qualitative dimension to gather lived experiences and community perspective, uh, perspectives a quantitative dimension to quantify and demonstrate outcomes that have credibility uh, for community members, funders, and scholars, and community-engaged research that allows for community participation in the process at all levels. Some of the impact evalu evaluation questions that our evaluator is mm -hmm. looking at are the extent to which participation in the program affect the risk and resiliency profile of the people, did the program reduce the risk profile of young people and through which paths? Did the program increase the resiliency of young people and through which paths? To what extent did the program enhancements uh, lead to positive change? Which program components have the greatest influence and impacts? What is the nature of the relationship between a young person's resiliency profile and both positive and negative behavior outcomes? And what, to what extent did the program have ripple effects on families, volunteers, and local partners and through which pathways? So the data collection methods include a review of documentation, secondary analysis of client case files. So the secondary analysis is done by our program evaluator. Repeated measures um, 
through standardized assessments, and I'll we'll see in a minute what the, the <coughs> resiliency assessment looks like, but there's two, there's the youth resiliency assessing developmental strengths, and then the child perception resiliency assessing developmental strengths. Those are the two uh, assessment tools. So also we'll try to look at school data, so official school data. In one area we do have um, the okay to access school data on, on youth. Um, in the other two areas it's a little bit more of a struggle, but we're going to continue to see if we can get access to, to school data. Feedback and satisfaction questionnaires. Uh, individual interviews with key informants, focus groups. Uh, there's the most significant change is storytelling. So we do case studies um, and we call it the most significant change. So each, uh, each agency when we're doing evaluations is asked to suggest some matches that could, um, you know, could to tell us the story about you know, what happened, what shifted uh, through that match. And then, of course, the evaluator does some field observation and small well, you know, case studies, social security case studies, and she'll follow them over the uh, evolution of uh, that approach. So the evaluation model is, um, so the purpose of this impact, of, uh, the impact evaluation is to assess the project's measurable impacts on the primary participants and other stakeholders such as families, volunteer mentors, and mentoring agencies. The impact evaluation will focus largely on effects of the program on its primary participants, namely young people between the ages of 10 to 18 who are at high risk of contact with the criminal justice system. The areas for inquiry for this impact evaluation relate directly to an evidence-based resiliency framework that captures both internal risks and strengths and external risks and strengths. So the assessment that we're using was developed in Canada by Dr. Wayne Hammond. Yeah. Know, Dr. Wayne Hammond? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and his colleagues at Resiliency Initiatives and AmeriCorps. Um, the Resiliency Framework, we have chosen encompasses and assesses 31 evidence-based developmental strengths of children. And I'm reading this because this is all complex stuff that I can never memorize in my head. And youth that are linked directly to positive youth development to well-being. So those are the 31 that are there. Um, they relate back to key, 10 key domains of youth resiliency. And the graph uh, that we see, um, 10 domains of these are 10 domains of resiliency and 31 developmental strengths. So that goes back to your question um, relating to resiliency. So the project started in June 2016. Um, our fiscal year is April 1st to March 31st. So our first lesson we learned. April 1st to March 31st is our fiscal year. Uh, and when we started the project in June 2016, we had to submit our evaluation plan. Once the evaluation plan was approved by the government, we had to produce, um, we had three months, sorry, to, to produce that evaluation plan. Once it was approved on December 2nd, 2016, we had one year from that year's <coughs> first evaluation report. So our due date for our evaluation reports is halfway through the fiscal year. So it's a little bit of a challenge because you're evaluating six months of two different fiscal years. So when we do our overall analysis of our programs, we do it over our fiscal year, whichever agency it is. And for evaluation, we're doing it over two fiscal years, six months and six months. So from June, June 2016 to September 30th, and that's why I'm presenting today on something that was finished as of September 30th, is the evaluation report that we're working with until September 30th of this year is based on the first year. And we are technically in our third year of the program. So as of September 30th, we had a total of one of uh, 29 one-to-one -one matches, 39% of the youth of the 75 youth. So um, I'll explain that in a second. Youth referrals are coming in faster than sites can provide mentors for. So you can see we had 29 one to one, but we had 75 youth that were eligible to be matched. And the, uh, there's an ongoing challenge with bringing volunteer mentors across all three sites. There's a good distribution of youth based on gender and age, with most youth um, falling in the category, ten, category of 10 to 15. And almost half of the youth in the program identify as indigenous, 46%. 53% of youth of Edmonton and Saskatoon are involved in child welfare system. So the reason why it's identified Edmonton and Saskatoon is that for the first annual report, we did not have statistics from Grand Prairie, which we will have in the year two. Any questions so far? Yeah. Well, from I mean, it can come in in any. Youth can come in through 
through a variety of doors. Do we, each agency does it their own way. We don't have cash office manage that. Each agency does their referrals in the way that they want to do them. So either they have contacts with schools or with child welfare systems or you know, someone, someone calls and says, hey, I have a need for you. But um, is there anything that, other than that? I keep looking at them over there because they're the, no, they're the ones who are doing every single thing. Yeah, you can be referred to the agency, other agencies that refer, yeah, children's services, parents. So the, um, the greatest individual risk factors for youth enrolled in the program <coughs> for the first year were 30%, 38%, sorry, um, expressed physical aggression by being hurtful or aggressive, which includes hitting or, or, or beating someone. 40% uh, were disengaged from school, 29% skipped school, while 32 had been suspended from school. One quarter of participants reported taking illegal drugs, doing something illegal other than <coughs> And of course, given the age range of 10 to 15, um, these are pretty significant risk factors. Because we you know when you start that in 10 to 15, going from 16 to 18, you're more likely to be age more. With the statistics, are you And with the statistics, is it kind of an ongoing basis, or are these just like at least one to two occasions? Or uh, so it's when they do the risk resiliency. So they do that when they're starting. So it's going through the history of what the title or Yeah, exactly. And this is, so for the first evaluation report, they would have done one uh, risk resiliency. They would be, this would not be showing the impact of the program yeah. because we had it done you know, the one year mark or the, the new one. Um, so we're trying to do them every year, uh, one year after the, the match. Uh, but yeah, at this point, they probably, September 30th, they probably went to them. And is this based on Wayne's uh, resiliency surveys and evaluation tools? Yeah. Yeah. And so this data did not include homeless youth or youth involved in criminal justice? So it would have involved uh, youth in, uh, involved, uh, sorry, it would have included youth involved in the criminal justice system, for sure. Homelessness, I'm going to ask. I've, uh, I don't see it anywhere in our documentation, okay. it, it, but it, it's very possible that it's, that it's there, and we just haven't listed it because it wasn't a uh, risk that was um, retained as the same as the Can I get a message? Is the example? Mm -hmm. So the sample would have been the 29 youth that were matched. Um, the 75, actually it would have been the 75, because the 75 would have done the risk assessment. So they, they do two, they do a pre-assessment uh, before they're matched, and then they do another one once they're matched, but we can see the, the difference. And so it would have been based on the, the 75 youth that were registered. I realize 10 is not for criminal justice, but there must have been some piece of it. I just didn't see your stats. Yeah, know. and I only highlighted, we only highlighted it, well, in the report, it was the, the bigger stats. The bigger stats. Okay. So in terms of the criminal justice system, I would just have to pull up the 100 It's not a way to report and find out, but I will mark it down. <laughs> I guess that's a good thing that it might be teeny. <laughs> well, I know for sure there are some, and uh, just based on our conversations the last couple of days, there's a couple that were involved in the criminal justice system. And with, yeah, I'm getting heads nodding. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so one dimension, just to go back to the, the, the classification system. So that's one thing that we're, we're looking at, just in terms of making sure that the tool that we're using to assess the risk factors is, exact, is the right tool that we want to be using. Um, we are having some difficulties with Know, entering you know, dashboards and that sort of thing. So it's possible we'll see a shift in the next year. Uh, maybe not, but uh, a pilot allows you that flexibility that if you know, your assessment tool is not giving you the information that you want, you can, you can change it over the course of the project. So we're kind of at that point now. So what have we learned and why is it relevant? Um, exactly where I was going with uh, resiliency assessment. So the circle project has highlighted the need for us to look at ourselves, at our organizations and our processes and systems as potential barriers. Sorry, I have a quick question. Sure. I'm just reading this over. How much of your program is, because you deal with, I want to say, you have big statistics, almost half were Indigenous. How much of your program is sort of focused on providing access culture to the zone? I'm going to turn to the agency. What do you do in terms of cultural? I know that we talk about it in group sessions. Um, there's a 
a desire to recruit Indigenous mentors into the program. Uh, but it, we're having difficulties recruiting mentors, period. And one of the reasons, um, as I just stated here, is the traditional mentor, so it could be a university student who's coming in, might not have the lived experience to, to work with you uh, that has some of these other classes. So there's that. There's just recruiting mentors in general. I think everybody here would probably say recruiting mentors is not as easy as maybe it, it used to be. So the culture, yes, I, I know that there was one session they made well, I'm just asking, like, more like, are you giving them access to participate in ceremonies, like a sweat or smudging so or sharing um, Saskatoon has the only Indigenous Relations Director for all of Big Brothers Big Sisters of Canada in our office. Um, she's been there for two years now, and so um, we haven't organized sweats or anything like that. Um, but we are making conscious efforts in terms of building partnerships um, and have developed a specific program. Um, that's focused on culture and reconciliation. Um, so in terms of the circle program, um, we're definitely making efforts. We're working um, with SAPA, which is a young Aboriginal group, um, to bring mentors in from there. We just had a presentation with them a couple of weeks ago. Um, and there's three focus areas in terms of what the group programming is. So there's life skills, culture, and recreation. Um, and we have done some cultural things Saskatoon has Wanaskewa, which is an internationally recognized indigenous park just located outside. Um, and the groups had sleepovers there last summer and took part in understanding TB raising and making bannock and stuff. Um, so we are making some conscious efforts to include cultural components. How about cultural components in your evaluation? Pardon? In your evaluation? So I'm seeing that you're considering those factors and doing an evaluation based on kind of a Western model, and um, I don't see many community strengths or risks that would actually take place in a First Nations community. So, maybe we can talk, because I'm not sure that I understand in terms of the risks that would be in a First Nations community. I think, it, I think the question is about, you know, evaluation itself and its methodology and where it comes from context and development of it being truly not, I think, true to form in sense of uh, Indigenous ways of knowing, um, Indigenous approaches to research, knowledge keeping, all of those things. I think part of that question is, is that being built into this model? And, and I think that just in general, from my own understanding, and Karen, you can jump in too, I think that evaluation and research were still a ways a way, a long way to go, I think, and we're trying, and my, and my organization is trying to learn more about how to um, help, I think it's, it's almost like, again, it's almost the two world views about knowledge keeping and what is knowledge and how do we gather knowledge and, and um, you know, involving Indigenous people in, in the research process and the fact that they've also been doing their own research. So I think that's a really good question for us going forward as a Alberta Mentoring Partnership um, topic, I think, Michael, wherever you go, you're sneaking out of the room. Um, <laughs> 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 we actually, we actually have one of, our, one, of our, one of our research presentations was from Bedera, which is an Indigenous youth mentor yes. program, and they were going to present this afternoon, right. but because of family we weren't able to, but I think we yeah. want to keep mind, when we, we do the wrap-up, we want to keep mind of how we might be able to bring that topic in to share with people, because there is experience, and I think the Canadian Valuation Society is a major international or national conference I think this month, yeah. and one of the pieces is happening up in, the, in the Northwest Territories that's really focusing on valuation in an Indigenous in, in a way, particular context. It would be great if we could, I, I'm sending one of my staffs actually to that session, and I would be happy to uh, have them come back, you know, provide maybe a, part of a webinar. <coughs> that up. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take that yeah. to the bank. I think it's a fantastic point and it's one that I'm, I'm taking down as a list of things to do and I didn't want to, you probably have, you might have thought about that in your project, but in, in Alberta in general, I think we, we do need to think about this and in a more intentional way. And, uh, and I'll give you an example. If, yep. if yes. In our, in my community, if we were to create a list of risk factors, we would never list being indigenous as a risk factor. Yeah. 
as a human being. So that's one example. So just how this is approaching. Um, yeah, you have to look at what the source of funding is. Public right. Safety Canada, yeah. and it's looking at the criminal justice system. And, and Tori just said something about passing the mic, so I'm wondering where that fits in <laughs> as far as funding goes. Yeah, that's very true. <laughs> that's very true. Yeah. So in terms of evaluation, it becomes tricky, right? Because you have to evaluate based on the criteria that is set out by the funding. The funding. So, and that's what you have to sign. Okay. This is our first year evaluation. <laughs> so we are, and you know, the what's next, and the, the, the lessons learned is 100% to bring the youth voice in, we need to bring in the communities that we're serving. They have, Public Safety Canada, a desire to reduce the number of Indigenous people in their prisons, and so that's why it's listed. It's not listed there because we think being Indigenous is a risk factor, but statistically, the risk of going to jail is higher if you're Indigenous. Statistics. That's right. It. Statistically, it's a crime to be Indigenous. So, like, so there's something huge about this. 100%. <laughs> so sometimes we need to color within the lines yeah. in order to make a change. And having a pilot project that's five years gives mm -hmm. us that. So this is the first year evaluation. This is what we're doing up until. Yeah. But your point is written down, and I agree with you. We can we can absolutely look at that. We can absolutely bring in you. We just hadn't gotten there. Stacy, do you have anybody on your committee who is from the founder um, who is bringing in these criteria, who's kind of that champion where when you're beginning to learn, hey, the language words that we're yeah. using around this yeah. is not the right language, right? I mean, or it's interpreted and yeah. received differently, right? Yeah. It, because we, I hear exactly what you're saying, the yeah. challenge of where the funding source comes from and needing to report back on everybody, anybody who ever got government funding knows that everything is pretty strict and you need to be reporting back yeah. in a certain way. Yeah. But, I guess from our experience, yeah, exactly. So the, it's, it's where's that point of leverage of influence? So is there somebody up the chain in the funding source who yeah. is that champion to think to where you can feed those messages? So if we look at the system that this project is being administered, so there are the three agencies who have their own teams and their own partners and they're only doing it. And myself at the national office, if we don't do a pyramid, we'll do it this way. The agency is the government, and I'm like in the middle. Okay, so I, I really need to ensure that the government gets what they want, coloring in their lines. The agencies get the support that they need to do whatever they need to do, which is hopefully coloring outside of the lines, mm -hmm. but I need to translate it. It's a slow process to get government to see outside the lines, mm -hmm. and that is 100% where I fit, but I need to understand that from the agency's perspective in order to translate that. And that's why I refer to them all the time about your questions about what's happening on the ground, because I don't really know every day what's on the ground other than when I talk to them or when I see them, and that's not my job to know. My job is really to, to get what the evaluation says, get feedback like this, make sure that we're bringing in. We need to bring in partners from indigenous communities at the national level as well. It's, it's difficult. We get funders and donors who say, hey, are you doing indigenous projects? Or with communities, or are you doing that? They want to, it's a hot topic, they want to, they want to fund it, but we don't want to just jump into something and do it for the community, we want to do it with them. This project kind of happened that we're doing it for them because that's just how it happened. The money came in and now we have five years, well, we're in year three, to build those relationships. So I think feedback like that is important. And when I mentioned before about bringing youth in to have those conversations, we're there. And that's where the lessons is learned on, right? So, you know, we need to change the way we do our stuff. We need to change our systems. We need to change the way that we intake. We need to take, change the way that we intake volunteers, how we find them. We need to move away from trying to fix the kids, as, as uh, Wayne said in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the video before. We need to focus on strength and not deficits. We need to truly understand the context that the youth are living in and that you know, will it impact the, the, re the research that we do. And we need to challenge our recruitment uh, methods. I'm just gonna finish this and then I'll get to questions because I see that I have like 10 minutes left. <clears throat> so, that, so what's next? Well, we have to develop a program. So we've kind of been running, you know, uh, making changes and that now we need to document it. Determine what are the required enhanced training modules for staff and for volunteers. So we have a list, but what are the ones that are going to be key? A deeper dive in what it means for volunteers to play an advocacy role. <coughs> and we have the openness that every year we can revise our theory and change our logic model. So 
So we're literally in the process now of starting to change or through change the logic model, which impacts the evaluation as well. So I don't know that those criteria will be allowed to be changed because they're not dictated, but they fit within the national strategy. And so it's within that, that color the line boxes. But we are allowed um, to add different elements to that evaluation that maybe the government don't need, but that we need. So that possibility is there. And we need to refine our data collection methods across the sites. And we talk about program implementation across three different sites that live in three different provinces and that have different staffs and that have different you know, priorities. How do you input your data, collect your data, <coughs> and deal with your groups? How do you do that and have the same data that an evaluator can pull together and evaluate? It's a little bit complex, so we're working on this. I saw hands. Here's my chance with my big question is, is there an allowance for tweaking and revamping along the way with evaluations? And then the second thing is, um, have you adapted the, the stuff from when? Um, have you adapted it? And if so, uh, can you share your adaptation tools? Like, are you willing to share those? resiliency surveys and stuff with others. Yeah, that I'll have to ask because that's really the program evaluator that um, that manages that piece. They don't, um, they actually have a meeting today that, I, that I'm participating in. So I will have to ask. Okay. And if so, will you just tweet it out? Yeah, I could do that. Okay, okay. awesome. <laughs> I can tweet it out. <laughs> question. Yeah, the question um, I had was um, your comment in terms of how how to recruit a different type of mentor? What, what is meant by that itself? A different type of mentor? Yeah. So the, the relationship, um, traditional relationship is about 12 months, and it can last much, much longer than that, but the initial commitment is 12 months. We're looking at it to 18 months. Enhanced training also means more training. They're showing up more. And your involvement with the youth might be very different. So a youth who has complex you know, has a complex life around them, a complex network. Um, it's not it's not necessarily that easy kid who you're gonna take to the ballpark and that's, that's it. You might have other issues that you have to deal with. And that's a different type of, what you mean by different type of culture. Mm -hmm. It could be the same person, but they just have to be willing to take that one. How many months did you say so much? About 18 months. Okay. But how's that been? <laughs> <laughs> so recruiting mentors, Challenge. And one of our, our um, strategies to deal with that is in July we actually are having a two-day conference, um, a workshop, internal workshop, uh, with some key stakeholders, partner with from the community who will join us to talk about that. How do we, how do we, how do we, do this? we have to, we have youth that are sitting on waiting lists, and the longer they're on waiting lists, you know, they're just they're discouraged or what have you, um, we don't want them on waiting lists, we want them match. But, and it's not written here, but I think it's written in the introduction in your agenda. We set, we're setting out to serve 700. So 700 units of service, which means that in year one, you'll count them once, but you might count them again in year two, right? The same, the same units might be counted twice. But over the five years, 700, that means we need a, about 700 volunteers. Stacey, are you considering the, the youth themselves identifying potential mentors? Is that something you're... Yes, so that's, that is, um, that was in the proposal. Yeah. That was in the original vision for well, the project. Well, not even here, because one yeah. of the research, um, and maybe we'll send this out to Michael, when we had the National Metric Symposium, there was a very strong <coughs> research project on um, trying to reduce the incidence of young people in the criminal justice system. But these kids were actually in the criminal justice system. And some of them picked mentors who actually they had met in the system okay. as well. So it's fairly, risky, but some of them had, the mentors yeah. first got checked out, um, and some of them had risen above and done some very good things, and the youth themselves felt very strongly about wanting to, to connect with them. I, I think it's still a risky thing around how mentoring matching works, mm -hmm. but I mean, I think to consider that, so look at, and there is, there is research, yeah. there's evidence that shows that in some cases that the youth yeah. shows and a mentor. Yeah who might have been a, in the justice system before, That's which it. then, of course, would probably disqualify you in terms of your criteria matching, but... Uh, well, but that goes back to, to the question at. about the different types of volunteers. There's also yeah. that evaluation criteria and the screening, just because you have 
um, criminal background, depending on what it is, of course, yeah. doesn't mean that you should be, you know, automatically the crime. There's also that perception that, well, you know, I have a, I have a criminal record, I won't even bother applying, right? So we have to, we have to deal with that, and that's part of the conversation in terms of what are the barriers for people walking through the door, and then how do we deal with these barriers? And in the original proposals, there was a desire to have you select mentors. I self-identify them and say, that's where I want to be my mentor, and then we bring them in because that youth has a good I don't think that we've gotten there just yet because it's not necessarily easy in you, and I think the proposal also outlines, you know, an older child, so maybe not a 10-year-old, mm -hmm. but maybe a 15-year-old might say there's someone naturally in my network that I would like to have as my mentor. So I think it, it's there, and it's, it was actually in my notes, which I did say, so thank you. Um, but we haven't been able to just do that yet. I see two hands, yes. So obviously this is big and little matches mentors, personal, very personalized. Mm -hmm. But have have you considered or is there room as you change in the last two years of the project to consider general staffing? And so for those kids that are waiting for matches, to do group stuff. Mm -hmm. So there is not considering that is the bulk of the work I would say right now. And the staff is taking on a long run. Waiting for like that's Jordan waiting for the one. That's right. So we had 29 matches, but we had 75 that were eligible September 30th. Those numbers have increased right, since mm -hmm. September 30th, and so they are 100% running uh, groups. You know, about once a month. In one case, it was twice a month. So we agreed to some parameters for groups moving forward as of the fall. So it'll be, be a minimum of one group session per month. Um, we'll try and divide them by by age. So like the 10 to 13 year olds are together, and 14 to 18 year olds are together. And, um, so there's a couple of parameters that we're that we're working on, but absolutely the youth are group trying to get them once they're not to come. Is really hard. I, 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 I'm sorry, I, I'm not trying. Once to a month period. is hard in terms of. Well, it's just it's not enough, and I realize you have limits and parameters of what you can do in funding. Probably. Yeah. But once a month mentoring is really tough for these kids. So the idea and the desire is for them to be in one to one matches, right? Right. <coughs> so the group would be um, a substitute. Well, not a, it wouldn't be a, yes. In some cases, a substitute if there isn't a, if there isn't a match. Right. But if there is a match happening, they'd also be able to come to you. It's a meant to keep them attached yeah. to the program yeah, while they're in when they're in the program. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Stacy, so we have about question. five minutes left. Okay. And, yeah. Other stuff. Uh, if you want to wrap up the presentation. Or? Yeah, I'll wrap it up with the video, and then I'll. Uh, but I'll ask because she's had her hands up for like. <laughs> oh, I just wanted to say, if you haven't looked into the natural sports framework that Alberta has, is like rolling out and stuff, it ties in really nicely to the early conversation around the youth identifying who they would like to have as mentors potentially, and it looks at just the fact that you, the youth do have a natural support network, and sometimes we as professionals think that it's not healthy, but we need to provide the tools to the youth so that when they are needing to reconnect with whoever those natural support people are, that they know how to do it in a safe kind of way that's respectful yeah. of the boundaries. Yeah. Um, so it might, it kind of ties in nicely with what you're doing. Yeah, and it really is a pilot, right? So I've given you the first year evaluation. We're six months into year, year two evaluation, but we're technically in year three fiscal year. So we still have until May 2021 to make adjustments to try different things. So, you know, as you think about this over the coming days and months and until 2021, please, you know, tweet, email, uh, it, it, that's how we will, we, will, um, we will make this the best program. And once it's available, once it's finished, then you will be able to, uh, to benefit it. So just one, uh, the last thing, so the circle, just to summarize, so the Circle is an inclusive youth mentoring program designed to give young people the confidence to achieve more. The Circle pairs youth with positive, understanding adults who encourage them to find strengths from within. Founded on the belief that people are empowered through consistent, supportive, and supportive relationships, the program is focused on young people who have experienced the pain of discrimination, poverty, and marginalization. marginalization. They discover they deserve, sorry, to have greater opportunities, and they deserve, deserve mentors who see the strength and talent within them. Men, mentors in the circle encourage you to find your voice. They are advocates and allies. Some mentors have experienced similar challenges and barriers themselves, and now want to volunteer to be the kind of person they needed when they were young. So that is what is on our promo material, literally. And this is one of our videos um, that we did. Um, disclosure. 
it's a good video, but it's not a great video. So it's a start of you know where we want to go. And yes, feedback is absolutely um, we're open, but it'll just give you an idea of the type of person that we're looking for to bring into.